so Julian, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation, and uh, I'll start by uh, saying a few words to to provide some context about my research and uh, how I developed an interest in the work of the Overseas Doctors uh, Association. And uh, I'd like to emphasise, uh, firstly, that uh, this presentation emerges from a wider project concerned with the role of South Asian doctors in the development of British general practice uh, from the 1940s to the 1980s. And the main output of that will be a book which is to be published next year by Manchester University Press as migrant architects of the NHS, South Asian doctors, and the reinvention of British general practice. Now, aside from, the, from the, the shameless plug, I think it's important to say this because I want to emphasise that the Overseas Doctors Association was not the primary focus uh, of my research, and its importance really came to the fore in the course of the 40 interviews that I conducted uh, with uh, doctors who became GPs in the NHS, and also as a result of the archival research that I carried out, in particular uh, research at the British Medical Association archives, which uh, documented uh, the lobbying that the ODA was doing, and also at the, uh, the National Archives uh, similarly. And uh, also I used uh, what I think is still an underutilised uh, resource, uh, personal archives belonging to uh, oral history uh, participants, and I was fortunate enough, as I was saying, to interview and meet some of the surviving early leaders of the ODA, uh, Satya Chatterjee, for instance, who has since uh, passed away, Sri Venugopal Krishna Kolipura, who is still, still with us, and through uh, those interviews and through looking at those materials, I gained insights into the history of the organisation. Uh, so I don't claim here to present the final word on the history of the, of the ODA, but rather I'm aiming to, to make uh, the case for its significance in the context of uh, post-war British medicine uh, and indeed as part of the voluntary sector in uh, post-war Britain. Now, if you Google Overseas Doctors Association, you'll find very little information. And I know that because I did this yesterday, and one of the first hits was the title of this talk, which <laughs> says it may, may, be, may be important to talk about the organisation because it has been practically uh, written out of uh, history in spite of the profile that it had at the time, and that was really one of the things that struck me when I started looking at the archival material, the importance that was attached to the organisation, and, and also the importance that people attached to it when I, uh, when I spoke to them. Uh, and also my focus is on the first uh, decade of the organisation, although it did continue to exist post-1985, uh, and uh, then through its successor organisation, BIDA, uh, which is the British International Doctors' Association, and it's still active uh, today although it doesn't play quite the same role of umbrella organisation that the uh, ODA did at the time for migrant uh, South Asian doctors and actually aspired to go beyond South Asian doctors. Uh, BAPIO, the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, has taken on some of the political functions of the ODA when it comes to taking the medical establishment to task for, its, for discrimination. Uh, so there's much more to be written about the organisation and its uh, wider history, and my ambition here is simply to to reflect on what I've found so far and really establish the significance of, uh, of this organisation. It is also an interesting period to look at uh, because it's during this time that the ODA became part of the medical landscape very quickly. It was set up in 1975 and very quickly was having meetings at very senior levels uh, within the medical establishment, within uh, government. And it's also during this period that it started to encounter problems which are not unconnected to its successes and its uh, rapid growth and uh, problems I'm sure you're not unfamiliar with to do with uh, voluntary sector organisations growing rapidly uh, and finding it harder to negotiate political realities uh, than to identify a, a problem uh, that uh, everyone could, uh, could agree uh, on that needed to be uh, tackled and uh, I'll explain uh, how the organisation was set up and why it was, uh, was set up and how it gained that momentum and also explore some of the reasons why fractures started to, to appear. Uh, I'd also like to say that my interest, in, uh, by way of introduction, my interest in the ODA is part of a broader interest in the centrality of uh, medical migration to medicine in the UK, as I was uh, hinting at um, earlier. And uh, to, to emphasise this, an interesting exercise that you can uh, carry out online, again, is to look at the uh, General Medical Council uh, website, which now allows you to search for doctors who are registered in the, in the UK. Uh, so if you put in a particular name, it'll uh, give you all of the, uh, the doctors who have that name who are registered in the, in the United Kingdom. And uh, doing a search for Patel turns up roughly the same number as doing a search for Smith. 
uh, which gives a sense of the, of the scale of this movement. And I say that to emphasise that I, I think this really is something that needs to be at the heart of the history of the NHS and at the heart of, uh, of British medicine. Now, obviously, not all of those doctors will be migrants, but anecdotally, it does seem that a lot of uh, South Asian, British-born South Asian doctors are actually the children of uh, migrant doctors uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, more generally, given the much smaller numbers of South Asians in the UK in the 1940s, it's clear that uh, generally these doctors will be the, uh, the children of, uh, of migrants. Uh, so, again, to emphasise, this history should not be, in my opinion, something that's seen as an add-on or as something marginal in the context of the, of the history of the NHS. And one of my key interests is in looking at how migration has shaped the mainstream of British society, so looking at migrants not simply in terms of their experience of mobility, identity and culture, but also in terms of their centrality to the making of modern Britain. And in so doing and building in particular on the work of scholars such as the French historian Gérard Royer, who pioneered the reintegration of migration into the French national narrative back in the 1980s in his book The French Mounting Pot. And, uh, and also when it comes to the UK more specifically, uh, building on the work of scholars such as Rosina Visra, Panikos Panay, Cynthia Brown and Linda McDowell, just to name a few. And as McDowell has pointed out, focusing on work is actually an excellent way of getting a better understanding of the impact of migrants on the societies they have settled in. So looking at the medical, political activity of doctors and the way that they interacted with and shaped the medical mainstream was a way for me of engaging with these questions about the impact of migration on the development of medicine and healthcare. And I think that focusing on this history and on the attempts of a group of South Asian doctors to influence the development of medicine and healthcare in Britain is also of contemporary relevance, as we were saying before, given the UK's ongoing dependency on medical migrants, concerns about the future availability of the EU medical workforce, uh, and efforts to come currently to step up recruitment from, uh, from in India. So again, this raises the question uh, of how these doctors can feed into medical policy, what sort of support needs they may have and what might we learn from, uh, from this history. And uh, policy relevance of history is again one of my central interests. Uh, and I do think that on re reflecting on this history we can get a sense of how uh, migrant doctors have engaged in the past with medicine and healthcare, try to defend their rights and try to shape policy and this can inform the way we uh, engage with migrant doctors uh, today. Certainly some of the initiatives taken by the ODA in terms of social support and training did seem to have a significant impact uh, based on the interviews that I carried out with, uh, with doctors. So I just wanted to, to give you some context regarding my approach to the subject and what I think is interesting about it. I personally believe that it's important for historians to reflect on their personal agendas and what informs uh, their research and to be, um, to be open about that. Uh, another thing I should say about the ODA in terms of general context is that, again, as I've alluded to, so clearly you're asking the right questions, in spite of its name, it was very much a South Asian-led organisation. So it is something of a, a, of a paradox in that it aspires to represent all international doctors, but actually it tends to principally represent or certainly be led by South Asian doctors who make up about half of uh, half of overseas doctors at the all overseas doctors at the at the time. So basically, 10, 15 percent of overseas doctors uh, are South Asian, uh, as opposed to between sort of 20, 25, up to 30, uh, depending on how it's calculated. Overseas doctors um, in all. And the final thing I'll say by way of introduction is regarding my use of the term South Asian and Indian subcontinent. I'm not unaware of the politics, but I'm using them mainly for the sake of convenience, uh, and obviously I, that doesn't mean I'm unaware of the differences within the group, but I feel there is a shared history, not least a history shaped by empire there in terms of medicine, and in terms of the deployment of doctors we're within the NHS, and I think it's important to, uh, to explore and establish uh, the significance uh, of, the, of this history prior to potentially exploring the ways in which the experiences of these doctors may, uh, may differ. So I'll start by talking about the pre-ODA period uh, when it comes to understanding the, the role of the, of the ODA and its uh, establishment. Uh, and uh, I'll explain the, the context of post-war medical migration uh, and the development of the NHS and the way in which these doctors were deployed in the NHS because that is absolutely crucial to understanding why the ODA was set up and what it was a response to and also to understanding how it functioned and how it was able to engage quite successfully uh, from what I've seen uh, with uh, the British political and medical political establishment. 
One of the things that I think is key uh, when it comes to the post-war movement of doctors to the UK is that it needs to be linked to imperial history. And uh, when I started researching this, a few people said to me, oh, you know, don't bother, start in the 1950s, 60s, that's when migration starts picking up from the Indian subcontinent, that's when it becomes interesting. And for no real good reason at the time, other than some stubbornness and curiosity, I decided to start digging further into the past and found that there were doctors who were working when the NHS was set up, there were doctors uh, pre-war. And obviously the, the numbers were much smaller, but I think in terms of the, of, of the connections, they are very uh, significant. And uh, what we see in the post-war period is not something that appears from nowhere. It's, it's very much the uh, amplification of uh, well-established uh, patterns. Uh, and there's movement from, uh, of doctors from uh, India to the UK. It's established from the 19th century. And it's gradually gathers pace throughout the 20th century and becomes uh, quite significant, really, from the 1950s uh, onwards. Uh, but essentially, uh, empire establishes what Roger Jeffrey described as the institutionalization of medical dependency. In other words, the establishment of a medical system and a system of medical training in the Indian subcontinent, which is devoted to serving the needs of the British Empire. And as he argues quite convincingly, that has never really been dismantled. And uh, the post-war, the post-independence period, is not a period where uh, Indian and Pakistani governments challenge the structure of medicine in the subcontinent. It very much continues to function along the uh, the same lines. Uh, and. Uh, What's worth remembering as well is that although the numbers of uh, migrants may have been quite small, doctors who had trained in the UK accrued a certain amount of prestige as a result. So when they went back, they often found themselves in quite influential positions. They were teaching in medical schools. They were responsible for developing the curricula. So this helped me to understand what the doctors that I went to speak to were saying to me when they talked about uh, their training and the experiences that they had. And one of the things I found really hard to understand and to interpret initially uh, was that when I was asking doctors about uh, migrating and how they came to that decision and to describe that, I, I, I then listened to the first maybe five, six, seven interviews and I felt uh, there was absolutely nothing there and I thought this is very bizarre and I just started asking the question differently and actually what I slowly realised was that they weren't talking about it because they didn't see it as a huge um, moment of rupture and it was quite striking to me that actually what they were describing was moving within the same intellectual space. They were moving essentially within the British Empire still. They weren't moving from India to uh, Britain and describing to me as a new huge geographical <coughs> shift. They were talking to me about having been socialised in a particular way of thinking and sort of moving uh, to the place that actually medicine in India was, um, was looking to. So to give an example of, um, of some of this, this is an interview I conducted with uh, Dr. Raman N. Rao, and uh, he talks about uh, the education he received in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, and uh, there's this conflation of contexts in India and the UK, which is a recurring theme of the, uh, of the interviews. Uh, and you know, whether indeed the curriculum was very similar uh, in uh, Cambridge uh, and Andhra Pradesh is actually neither here nor there when it comes to interpreting that. What is important to me is that that's how people perceived it at the time uh, and that's how they saw themselves. And I think it's important not to retrospectively take this for granted in the sense that it's perfectly conceivable that what we would have seen would have been a, a radical rupture uh, in uh, 1947 at the moment of partition with government saying well actually what we now need is doctors going out to rural areas with basic training uh, and actually that's not that's not really what uh, what happened what happened is very much a continuation of the old uh, models that's the same doctor graduating in uh, Andhra Pradesh in the in the 1950s uh, and again if you look at that that image there's nothing there that distinguishes him uh, as a graduate from uh, from a subcontinental uh, university. Uh, and you know, this is just to, to, to give a, a feel for who these doctors were and how they were socialised, because I think that is quite fundamental to, to the impact that they had uh, on the British uh, medical system subsequently. And, uh, and, and essentially, it's, it's not just that uh, doctors felt that uh, this was something natural to do, it's also because uh, the uh, medical system still looked at the, the system in, in the UK as uh, the place to be if you wanted to be successful in, in medicine. And uh, another participant, Raj Chandra, who passed away a few weeks ago, sadly, uh, used this quite striking phrase when I spoke to him about the Royal Colleges in 
Ceylon at the time, he says Sri Lanka, but the Royal Colleges being uh, uh, still under the rule of the Royal Colleges in, in England. And I think that's, that is a very good way of, uh, of describing the, uh, the situation at the, uh, at the time. Uh, another thing I find quite striking is these portraits are not portraits that I framed, as I ask people to frame them themselves. And uh, uh, you have very few indications in these images of uh, anyone claiming their South Asian identity or making a connection to the Indian subcontinent. They're very much uh, in their homes in the sort of, sort of very, uh, very British context and part of the landscape. And that's how they chose to frame them, which I thought was quite a quite an interesting statement. So I think, again, if you want to understand the ODA, it's important to understand the psyche of the doctor. He was one of the uh, early uh, leading uh, members, and a lot of the people who are quoted here are uh, leading members, also a few other doctors who just talk about attending meetings and that being quite, uh, quite an important thing uh, for, uh, for them. But certainly some of the, the leading members of the organisation were uh, very much influenced by this, uh, this general, uh, general context. Uh, and another, again, Ruben Prasad, I think, was uh, one of the general secretary, I think certainly one of the leading members in the, in the late 19, uh, 1980s, and he, again, talks about having ambitions to, uh, to succeed in medicine and wanting to go back. And that's a, another key theme of the interviews, is that people came to the UK to gain expertise, to gain skills and plan to, plan to travel back. None of the doctors that I interviewed uh, although they were all, uh, all GPs, what, 40 of them were, uh, planned to come to the UK to become GPs. They all planned to come to the UK to gain training in a particular area, then go back or maybe have a career in a British hospital, but certainly not to become, uh, to become doctors. Uh, and again, I think that a, a telling word that he uses there is no notion of compulsion. It's you know, something that you, you had to do if you wanted to, uh, to be successful. Um, now this is the, the environment in which doctors were uh, were operating uh, in, and at the same time, uh, you know, these are people who are training in the fifties, nineteen sixties. At the same time, you have a fundamental, uh, quite radical expansion of the NHS and uh, quite huge needs in terms of workforce at the, at the same time as a as a result. Uh, so uh, although you had an established movement of doctors to the UK, there were a few hundred, that one figure suggests around a thousand by the early 1950s, but I've having looked up the original source and found that there's no explanation as to where that comes from. I tempted to take it with a pinch of salt and I suspect it might be slightly less. But even if we accept that, say about a thousand when the NHS was set up, uh, by the end of the 1970s, we're talking about 10,000 doctors born in the Indian subcontinent and working in the NHS. So that's a tenfold uh, increase. Uh, and uh, essentially, you have a continuation of the imperial system of movement that accelerated by the fact that, obviously, other factors, transport, become, international transport becomes more straightforward, but also you have uh, this new organisation that is set up that is expanding. Uh, and that has a, a need for a, for a workforce. Now, not just any type of workforce, because the other aspect of this, um, which is what leads uh, pretty much directly to the establishment of the, of the ODA, is the question of how these doctors are deployed in the NHS. And that's why I started by talking about the psyche, because these doctors essentially, uh, in some ways, see themselves as British. Certainly some did, and were very explicit about that. Some describe themselves as not feeling not British, which is more subtle, and some felt that, well, you know, they, know they were, but certainly they were, certainly they were part of a culture, culture of medicine, once you socialise within the culture of medicine in the Indian subcontinent, you were part of something that was quite closely connected to, uh, to the UK and to British ways of, uh, ways of thinking. Now this, obviously, was not how doctors, well, maybe it isn't that obvious, but certainly it wasn't how doctors were perceived when they came to work in, in the NHS. So they had quite different expectations about what they would be able to do uh, uh, which jarred with the reality that they found. And they were largely deployed in junior positions, uh, often in what were termed at the time peripheral hospitals, so areas that uh, UK doctors were particularly keen to work in, industrial areas, areas in the north of England, South Wales, um, etc. Uh, and uh, often they were concentrated in particular medical uh, specialties. Uh, so I'm taking the example of general practice, which is where I conducted the bulk of my research. If you look at the total number of uh, South Asian doctors in general practice by the early 1980s, it's about 16%. It's also less than 2% in areas such as Devon and Cornwall. It's over 
in areas such as Walsall in the Midlands, Earl Parking and Havering in, uh, in Greater London. So the importance of these doctors varies hugely depending on specialty uh, rank within the medical system uh, and the part of the country that people uh, happen to, to be uh, working with. And uh, obviously part of that is about people's access to, to medical networks uh, and sponsors within the system, but also a huge part of uh, what channeled people into particular roles was also racism in medicine, which uh, there was a study that was done in the early 1990s that finally pinpointed the extent of this statistically. Uh, Smile Everington uh, research, which was published in the BMJ in 1993, which is one of these studies involving taking names out of CVs, but uh, having CVs that were broadly equivalent, sending them out, and they found that uh, the response rates for doctors with uh, traditional English sounding names, as they were described, were higher than the uh, rates for uh, doctors with traditional Asian sounding <coughs> names. Uh, and this is something that had been suspected for quite some, uh, some time. And in actual fact, once you start researching the history of medicine at the time, you realise it's not particularly hidden. And uh, doctors talk about this quite, uh, quite eloquently. And uh, this is someone who, at the time I interviewed him, was uh, vice uh, chair of the uh, Royal College of uh, General Practitioners. So you wouldn't describe him as an embittered outsider, but talking quite openly about what was happening. Uh, within his specialty when he was uh, uh, trying to build a career in it. I think in his case that would have been in the early uh, early 1970s. And uh, uh, this story about different paths of application is actually something of a recurring theme. So I'm not sure if this literally happened, but certainly it does give a sense of how people felt mm. that they were treated at the, uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, also it's important to... Uh, note that this is not simply a question of discrimination on the basis of ethnicity. There were various mutually reinforcing factors that could lead to people being marginalised. Obviously gender, as he alludes to, I found sometimes that uh, it was it seemed that certainly uh, the strength of someone's accent could act as a marginalising factor as well. And I found some of the doctors who were more prominent medical politicians were the doctors who'd been privately educated in the subcontinent uh, and uh, were more anglicised, to, uh, to put it in quite simplistic uh, terms. So various things that, that could have an impact on doctors' trajectories, but again, so fem female doctors in particular uh, talk about uh, gender being quite strong, not necessarily additional marginalising factor, it could be the primary marginalising factor, as uh, Dr. Pramata Patak describes when she talks about her entry into, into general practice. So, this is you know, someone talking about applying for jobs and not being able to get into, into jobs because she was told openly that even if she was the best candidate, she wasn't going to be appointed. Uh, and then she goes on to explain how, as a result, she uh, decided to open her own surgery. Now, that was in Russia, in the inner city of Manchester, where at the time, uh, because of the shortage of doctors in these areas, uh, there were open areas. If you were uh, uh, recognised uh, as a doctor by the General Medical Council, you could open a practice. So the obstacle wasn't there, but the obstacle wasn't there in an area that was obviously very unpopular. And well, these people didn't uh, didn't want to go and uh, go and work. So this is how you ended up with these concentrations uh, of doctors in particular parts of the uh, of the country. And I don't generally like to inflict long quotes on people, but I think this is quite a good one when it comes to getting a sense. Uh, of the, uh, the general culture of medicine at the time and the pervasive nature of racism and discrimination based on all sorts of uh, criteria. And Paul Ferris's book, The Doctors, is quite, uh, quite an intriguing insight into, uh, into the culture of medicine uh, in, um, in those days. So I'll let you read that, but certainly... Uh, obviously, uh, Ferris was a freelance writer and you might expect that... Uh, Certainly the quote at the, at the end is the sort of thing that a freelance writer might include ahead of more nuanced assessments of, uh, of colleagues. But one of the things I find quite interesting about that is uh, he, the fact that he talks about uh, the, the various you know, forms of uh, objections to different types of doctors. And he, the quote at the end uh, he describes as coming from a particularly explicit doctor. So he isn't described as being off the scale or some particularly uh, uh, unrepresentative, but he is particularly explicit. And I think that is a fair description of the atmosphere of the time. If you look at the, at the medical press, I mean, there are adverts at the time that explicitly state that uh, this post is for a UK trained doctor and, uh, and so on. So just to end on this general context, which I think is essential to understanding what the ODA does and what its agenda is, 
yeah, these are, for instance, some of the uh, the areas that um, overseas doctors ended up being concentrated in, and you can see the uh, the contrast between areas such as such as general surgery, general medicine, which are traditionally considered as more prestigious, and then areas such as and actually even within particular fields. So you know, the contrast between psychiatry, where the percentage is much higher, but then learning disability, where it uh, it goes above fifty percent, and then if you if you add to that, these are consultants, of course, so these are senior positions. If you, on top of that, start looking at more junior positions, uh, and you start looking at positions in industrial areas, uh, inner cities, and, and so on, uh, you get even higher uh, figures. So. Uh, by the mid-70s, uh, we've therefore arrived uh, at a situation where there was a large number of doctors from the Indian subcontinent in place uh, who've developed a fairly strong sense of grievance uh, as a result uh, of uh, some of these uh, phenomena. So that's the background, essentially, to the establishment of the Overseas Doctors Association in 1975. Now, why does this happen in 1975? I mean, obviously, there's always an element of... Uh, uh, of chance in these things, uh, but I also feel that it's no coincidence that by then, the doctors who'd started to arrive in greater numbers in the 50s and in the, in the 60s had had the time to become established, create networks, had gone beyond working in junior posts in hospitals, and they basically obtained their first consultant post or decided to move into uh, general practice. So in, in a way, they, they probably were in a position where they might start thinking about doing something about the environment in which they found themselves, rather than having to uh, respond to uh, immediate uh, issues. In addition to this, there are a number of things that seem to have acted as, uh, as triggers, uh, and uh, one of them is the uh, Madison Committee on the Regulation of the uh, Medical Profession, uh, which uh, looked at uh, the regulation of the medical profession, obviously, but one of the things it explored uh, was the um, uh, role of overseas doctors and uh, the way that um, their registration should be treated in the, in the UK. And in particular, uh, the uh, committee made a claim that was considered quite inflammatory at the time, that uh, they had uh, seen evidence that overseas doctors had less advanced skills than uh, UK trained uh, doctors. Now, from what I've seen, that's a conclusion that's apparently based on the opinions of white doctors who are either part of the medical establishment or had access to the medical establishment, uh, and it was just presented by the uh, committee as fact. So that was uh, obviously not, uh, uh, didn't go down particularly well uh, with uh, overseas trained uh, doctors and seemed to act really as a catalyst for a number of, uh, of frustrations uh, and the uh, the way in which people uh, saw their deployment within the, the system. Now, of course, more generally at the time, we're also moving from a, a period where immigration, moving into a period where immigration is becoming increasingly politicised, and we're moving away from a post-imperial uh, space with a relatively free movement, especially when it came to, uh, to doctors with qualifications that were recognised in the, in the UK, and we're moving towards the introduction of uh, professional uh, testing, uh, and being seen as pro-immigration becomes uh, politically toxic, and that is something that I think also has an impact on, uh, on doctors. Uh, and another factor which, uh, which clearly seemed to act as a, as a trigger for the establishment of the ODA, which initially, again, I found quite puzzling, was the question of uh, whether overseas trained doctors based in the UK were going to be able to um, practice within the EEC. Now, this was something that was being uh, discussed at the time between the British government uh, and uh, European governments, and um, I found it perplexing at the beginning because I thought surely there was a relatively uh, limited uh, market for South Asian doctors wanting to move to Germany or France to uh, to practice. But again, this is where the uh, the imperial hinterland is is interesting because it, it clearly, even though people in practice did not want to do that, they were quite upset by the fact that they were going to be denied the right to do it, if that makes, uh, makes sense. And this is something that people talked about a lot on this very, uh, very prominent in the early ODA literature and one of the motivations for its uh, establishment, one of the things that were raised in discussions with government uh, and uh, uh, with organisations such as the uh, British Medical uh, Association. Uh, and um, like for instance, an early editorial in ODA News which started publishing in 1976 uh, complained that uh, this meant, and I thought this was quite striking, that overseas doctors would not be able, as a result, to treat even their fellow British citizens in other common market countries. 
uh, and I thought that the that phrase fellow British citizens was something that was quite telling. And, uh, I think what, one of the dynamics here is essentially sort of jarring between the sort of closing down of this imperial space and the creation of a national space and actually doctors' uh, identity and their sense of belonging to uh, a wider uh, British space that was sort of defined more in, um, in imperial terms. Uh, so essentially, as a first step, uh, there was a meeting of an, a number of doctors to uh, talk about the establishment of, uh, of an organisation. They This was quite a small grouping initially. It met at uh, one doctor's house at Birmingham GP, Sri Venugopal. Uh, I've been in the room, it's not that big, so I can't imagine there were that many people. Uh, for the first uh, meeting, but it very quickly became uh, became quite prominent uh, and uh, recruited uh, significant uh, members. And uh, this is how it defined its uh, its agenda in the uh, in an editorial uh, in the first edition of ODA News, which came out the following <coughs> year. By which time, uh, the organisation already started lobbying, establishing contacts with uh, uh, with government, uh, etc. So it comes across to me quite strikingly when I, I look at the archival material and when you go, you go back and look at what ODA News was saying at the time, as quite an angry organisation, which in a way contrasts with the interviews. And uh, I think it, that's why it's quite useful to use the interviews in conjunction with uh, oral history, with uh, archival research at uh, times, because 30, 40 years down the line, <coughs> can be a lot more uh, reflective about uh, some of these uh, developments. But at the time, it does feel that this movement was fueled by uh, clearly strong dissatisfaction and an element of, uh, of anger, and people feeling they're treated like second-class uh, citizens. And feeling that essentially they, uh, the, the world that they bought into is being uh, being taken, uh, taken apart. And uh, I think the final sentence First two final sentences are quite striking as well, uh, and uh, in a sense, right, today we have the ODA, now we have something that is going to be in a position to address this agenda, to address these issues, and to do something uh, something about it. Um, one of the things that's quite telling as well is when they talk about the ODA's voice being heard, uh, even if it wasn't uh, liked, and that is one of the challenges that they had over the, uh, the next 10 years, was the extent to which they were going to become part uh, of the establishment or the extent to which they remained a more radical organisation. I, I see that as one of the, uh, one of the fundamental uh, splits and one of the fundamental difficulties that they, uh, that they had. Uh, and by s setting up this organisation, they were really making a, making a statement also, uh, I believe, about the fact that uh, this movement was not... Uh, Transient, and, and I think that's important to uh, it's important to not underestimate that because certainly well into the 1980s there was a sense uh, that uh, the movement of doctors did not constitute migration. It was portrayed officially as a form of aid to the Commonwealth uh, and as about uh, enabling doctors to acquire uh, enhanced skills, which they were then going to use uh, when they returned to their to their countries. Now, obviously. Uh, some doctors did indeed return, but also a significant numbers settled in the, in the UK. Uh, and uh, I think that this, the establishment of this organisation was also a way uh, of uh, claiming that space and sort of claiming a voice within the, uh, uh, the British medical establishment uh, and within the, the British uh, healthcare system. So those are the circumstances surrounding its uh, establishment, uh, and um, it certainly uh, very quickly uh, in its first year gained access to the uh, to the establishment and gained a uh, very prominent position within the uh, within the medical landscape in the in the UK. Uh, its first edition published first edition of ODA News reported that it gained recognition from the establishment and the various august bodies which control the future of British medicine educationally as well as politically. Um, and you know, one thing that struck me when I, this is also what was reflected in interviews that I, that I carried out, and I, and I thought, well, this, it, it's quite strange because I haven't heard of this, uh, this organisation, and uh, uh, obviously I was suspicious of uh, memories three, four decades after the event and thinking, well, maybe this is... Uh, uh, this is giving the organisation excessive importance. And uh, although I would 
not want to uh, say was more important than it uh, than it was. I think certainly I was quite surprised when I started looking at the records of the British Medical Organ Association Government Archives to find that very quickly after its establishment, the LDA leaders were yeah. having meetings with uh, cabinet ministers, and there was a reference in the National Archives to. Uh, a meeting with uh, Barbara, Ca Barbara Castle in September 1975. So very quickly, a few weeks after the establishment of the organisation, uh, they were uh, clearly talking to the uh, health secretary at the at the time. And also, actually, uh, uh, the letter refers to our talk at Dr. Raman's house. Uh, so it's not just an official meeting somewhere uh, with you know, five ten minutes with the minister. Clearly, they were being cultivated at the uh, at the time. And I'd like to do a bit more digging into that. And I, could get a sense to a certain extent, maybe with the Labour Party, they were pushing at an open door and potentially they were seen as quite useful politically. So it might not just be a question of how efficient they were, it might just also be a question of uh, where they were seen as politically uh, useful. But certainly they did achieve uh, their stated, uh, stated aims. Uh, and uh, ODA events were attended by the major figures involved in defining healthcare policy at the time, so both the Secretary of State for Health and Social Security, David Ennals, and his Conservative shadow, Patrick Jenkin, pictured attending its first annual dinner in 1976, which says to me it was clearly seen uh, as a political uh, force and the leaders of the ODA were seen as uh, uh, people who needed to be, uh, to be cultivated. Uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the 1970s, regular meetings were taking place between government ministers and ODA representatives, and a working group was established to bring together representatives of the ODA, the Department of Health, and the regional health authorities with a brief to examine problems facing overseas doctors and to explore what action might be taken. Uh, the ODA had met with Derek Stevenson and Elson Gray Turner, who were the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of the BMA, as early as June 1975, and discussions eventually led to an agreement in 1976 on the co-option of an ODA representative on the BMA's General Medical Services Committee, which dealt with matters concerning general practice. And uh, South Asian GPs also gained representation on the GMC, the General Medical Council, the body represented, responsible for the regulation of the medical profession in the UK. And uh, by 1984, there were five ODA members uh, on the uh, General Medical Council. And uh, the ODA was from the outset very ambitious, and uh, as uh, illustrated by this letter to ODA members, uh, from its uh, general secretary and its uh, chairman in uh, 1984. Now, when I was looking at this material, I thought that the, uh, the fact that five members had been elected to the GMC was quite impressive, but clearly it was perceived as a disappointment at the, uh, at the time. Uh, and reading between the lines of, uh, of that letter, it's also apparent that uh, uh, clearly there's a degree of disappointment with the extent to which the, uh, the members mobilised and uh, turned out for this, uh, for this road. Uh, and uh, which suggests that uh, there is uh, some sort of a split between the membership and the leadership and its, uh, uh, and its ambitions already, and that was to become much more apparent by, uh, uh, by 1985. Now, not only were they taking part in these discussions and, and getting uh, elected to these uh, positions, but also they were... It wasn't just a question of the, the action that they were taking, it was also about the influence they were able to exert uh, on the medical establishment uh, as a result of uh, being in these, uh, in these positions. And uh, I also did an interview with the former Chief Medical Officer, Liam Donaldson, who uh, gave me this perspective on uh, the role of the ODA and similar organisations too, because other organisations were active at the time. The ODA was a, essentially an umbrella group which then took on a... Uh, a quite prominent uh, role. Uh, and uh, this was quite telling as well, and establishing the importance of the, of the ODA to me, you know, beyond what I was able to get from all history interviews, beyond some archival evidence of, of meetings. It was also perceived as significant as someone who was quite junior at the time, but who sub subsequently became a very prominent uh, medical uh, uh, politician. And uh, you know, he clearly indicates that the, the ODA was... Uh, uh, was shaping the way in which people thought. And uh, I thought one of the things that were quite striking, was quite striking in that interview as well, uh, was the way in which he talks about the, uh, the way in which uh, the ODA functioned and the way it was quite able to uh, tap into the medical establishment and to understand how it functioned and to who you needed to speak to and how you needed to, uh, to get an influence. So clearly it was uh, an organisation 
uh, that uh, became quite effective uh, in gaining a profile uh, and also in influencing uh, policy. Now, for instance, there's evidence of the National Archives of the ODA being involved in the stock rickets uh, campaign in the, uh, in the 1970s and, uh, and 1980s. The extent to which the ODA shaped that and uh, uh, was instrumental in it is uh, debatable and uh, different uh, leading members give different accounts uh, of, uh, of this which give the organisation more or less prominent roles. What is quite clear is that it was part of the, part of the picture. It was taking part in, in, de in debates, it was influencing policy. Now, again, I don't want to overstate its importance, but I think it's important to recognise that it was there and it was part of the part of the picture. Although, in terms of lobbying and in terms of the influence of an organisation, it's very difficult to pinpoint precisely uh, where influence is being uh, exerted. But there is, however, very direct uh, evidence uh, of uh, the ODA uh, directly shaping uh, national policy from uh, 1977, when uh, the uh, General Secretary of the ODA at the time, uh, S.A.A. Gilani, argued in the British Medical Journal uh, for the abolition of the system of temporary registration, uh, which allowed overseas doctors to practice in the UK but could be withdrawn at any time, and he argued instead for migrant doctors to be able to progress towards full registration. This was at the time when the system was being reformed. And the following month, uh, Lord Hunter Fawley put forward two amendments to the Medical Bill in the House of Lords, which brought in a system of limited registration and allowed for progress to full registration. And he actually quoted from Gilani's article when moving the amendments and noted that they had the support of the ODA. So again, it's telling that this was, uh, this was seen as, um, as something that was important. So the ODA was influential in terms of uh, policy. It also had a media profile at the time. Um, 1979, The Guardian, for instance, reported its decision to complain to the GMC about gynecological examinations that migrant women were subjected to at Heathrow Airport and the fact it was asking for a ruling on the ethics of such practices. Uh, 1985, medical magazine Doctor devoted its main headline to the news that the ODA was calling for medical migrants to boycott Britain in response to the government's decision to introduce work permits for migrant doctors and also to restrict postgraduate uh, opportunities. So by highlighting the issue of discrimination in British medicine, obtaining representation on a range of bodies and raising a national profile of issues surrounding ethnic minority health, the ODA was clearly playing a significant part in the development of uh, national policy between the mid-70s and the 1980s. And um, the ODA and associated uh, organisations formed by South Asian doctors was also at the time providing support to uh, international medical graduates by uh, offering a network and a uh, form of, uh, of support, social support and also professional support. Uh, and indeed ensuring that its members had access to educational opportunities in British medicine was one of the ODA's priorities from the outset. And one of the ten principal demands listed in the first edition of ODA News was for full participation in postgraduate training activities. Uh, this was, for instance, the case when it came to uh, general practice and in 1976 ODA News reports that the Secretary of its West Midlands Division uh, had held meetings with the Director of the Board of Graduate Clinical Studies at Birmingham Medical School uh, and this was to discuss postgraduate training in general practice for overseas doctors and in a way integrating overseas doctors into the system of medical training that was developing for, uh, for general practice. Uh, there's also a guide to uh, passing the uh, membership uh, of the uh, Royal College of GPs examination was written by a Salford GP that was included as, uh, as part of, uh, of ODA News. So clearly there's an effort there to establish links with the mainstream, but also more generally the ODA was uh, establishing a parallel system of educational um, opportunities uh, and uh, professional developments, which brought general practitioners uh, in contact with other doctors who uh, migrated from the Indian uh, subcontinent and uh, people who are working uh, in, uh, in other specialties. So this is, this, for instance, the description of some of these meetings given by uh, Krishna Kauripura, who uh, described to me how these, uh, how these groups functioned and, uh, and their scale as well.
Now, obviously, he talks about several hundred doctors, and uh, which might uh, be subject to caution in the context of non history interview. But I've also seen photographs of these meetings, which do suggest they were very well uh, attended, uh, and I have no reason to to doubt that. And certainly, at the time, it did have a, a substantial uh, body of, uh, of members who were taking part in uh, in activity. And clearly, this this was something that responded to uh, to a need. So this is, again, one of the early leaders of the ODA, and then I told there was a GP in uh, Bake Up in, uh, in Lancashire. Uh, and uh, the question I put to him was, well, why did you feel the need to organise uh, these, uh, these meetings uh, and uh, these um, lectures and, uh, and this training in, uh, in parallel? And... Uh, Clearly there was some sort of need, it's not exactly clear uh, why uh, it was felt, and I think there might have been certain reluctance to talk about uh, some of the, the racism in medicine at the time and uh, some of the experiences that people had, but certainly it was felt that this was, uh, this was something that was necessary and offered opportunities that people wouldn't have uh, otherwise. Uh, I've, I've wondered about the use of the word relaxed and uh, I find, find that quite intriguing, but clearly it, it was something that people felt more comfortable with and people felt was uh, was meeting a demand at the at the time. Possibly one of the answers to that is, uh, is this interview with an anonymous participant who explains also that it wasn't simply about about training uh, and about uh, professional development, it's also simply about uh, about networking. And again, here's a reference to several hundred uh, doctors uh, meeting and, uh, and talking about uh, medicine uh, but also talking about uh, their careers, probably creating professional networks and uh, and finding it um, uh, a really uh, as, you know, not just a, a medical grouping but also as a way of uh, uh, of getting uh, support uh, and of, uh, of being able to thrive uh, in the UK. Obviously, as he points out, there were there were few opportunities and there are now uh, open to people to to communicate outside of. Uh, uh, of their immediate surroundings, where people could sometimes feel quite uh, quite isolated. So this is, in broad terms, what the uh, what the ODA was uh, was doing, and it uh, was providing uh, an outlet for doctors, or not just campaigning and influencing policy, but also providing an outlet for doctors to access training and to develop uh, professional uh, networks. And uh, as I said, there's little doubt to claim the uh, no reason to doubt the claim that these uh, meetings were indeed uh, well uh, attended. And there's a clear overlap between educational uh, and uh, professional exchange and uh, social uh, gathering uh, and uh, the organisation defined itself from the outset as uh, being there to provide support to its uh, members and uh, according to its memorandum of association it aimed to provide a comprehensive counselling and career service and uh, by the late 1970s it had established an advisory service with the support of the THSS and uh, in 1976 ODA News was encouraging its readers to create more local divisions quote not only to strengthen the cause of the overseas doctors but also to perform a social need among overseas doctors and their families. So those are the, the successes of the organisation after it was uh, established. It uh, very quickly um, started to encounter a number of difficulties and also it was clearly from the outset characterised by a number of, uh, of shortcomings. As I've already alluded to, in spite of its name, uh, it was dominated by South Asian doctors. Certainly in terms of the leadership, I have been told that there were members who were not South Asian at the time. If you went to meetings, you would see African doctors and, and doctors from other countries. But in terms of who was leading the organisation, uh, as far as I've been able to ascertain through archival research and looking at the, who was attending meetings uh, when the organisation was set up, uh, names that were mentioned in interviews with leading members, nothing has cropped up that... Uh, uh, that uh, took me beyond the Indian subcontinent in terms of the uh, of the leadership of the uh, of the organisation. It's also a very male-dominated organisation during this uh, this period. Uh, there was a women's forum that was uh, established. And I did sp uh, also interview a few doctors who were part of that, but uh, certainly from the interviews that I did at the time, I didn't get very uh, much uh, a sense that uh, it was particularly active. Uh, in that particular decade, there are some activities that developed further further down the line. Uh, so it seems to come to the fore uh, later. Uh, and certainly uh, throughout this period, it was very much uh, dominated by, um, by male doctors. 
the other uh, aspect that comes to the fore that people seem to find uh, slightly difficult to talk about and be reluctant to talk about, uh, and which is where uh, memoirs uh, and archival research are, are useful, uh, was the, the issue of the extent to which the organisation was able to uh, bring together doctors from different parts of the of the Indian subcontinent, and that was one criticism uh, that was directed at the organisation by one of its early leaders, Akram Said, uh, in his uh, memoirs in the shadow of my takdir, and uh, he talks about this in quite um, in quite stark terms. He was from uh, Bangladesh, obviously originally Pakistan, then uh, became Bangladesh uh, further down the line in the 1970s. And he felt as a Bangladeshi doctor uh, very much marginalised uh, within the, uh, the organisation. I did also interview uh, S.A. Gilani, who was from Pakistan, who was also one of the leading members and said he disagreed with Akram Said and didn't find it uh, to be such a huge issue, but also seemed to be slightly reluctant to talk about some of these questions and did acknowledge that it was, uh, it was relevant. So it, it, I think it would be necessary to conduct more in-depth archival research or indeed to do all history interviews that would focus exclusively on the ODA to get a better sense of the extent of these problems, but it certainly does seem to be uh, something that uh, that was a concern at the uh, at the time. Another aspect of um, of the early history of the ODA uh, was the response of the establishment and the, the, the way that that marginalised uh, the uh, uh, the overseas doctors association. So. Uh, the establishment essentially starts responding to the creation of the ODA by moving on to its, uh, its territory, co-opting ethnic minority doctors and promoting them and uh, essentially saying that uh, it was uh, also representing uh, overseas uh, doctors. So if by 1980 the British Medical Association had decided it was no longer going to offer a seat to, to the ODA on the General Medical Services uh, Committee after offering one a few years uh, previous to that, uh, previous to that, it was able to argue that that was uh, because it was unnecessary because there were already three other South Asian doctors uh, who had not been uh, nominated by the ODA on the uh, on the committee, and it, obviously it was uh, also keen to put forward these doctors to make that point uh, on their behalf and to start saying that actually these points need to be made through the available um, structures. Uh, another issue that uh, doctors faced was uh, being co-opted into the establishment, uh, and some of the leading members were given. Honours uh, and um, in a way became victims of their success by being uh, becoming leading medical politicians. Uh, and uh, for instance, the uh, achievement of uh, Galani in managing to obtain this amendment uh, to uh, changes in their medical uh, regulations, which for some was, and certainly by him and others, was seen as an achievement in that it made life easier for overseas doctors and it opened the possibility for them to obtain permanent registration. That was also seen as facilitating uh, the establishment of a system that was more repressive than the system that went before. So I don't know to what extent these problems were avoidable, but certainly they started becoming uh, more apparent uh, as time uh, went by. So by the early 1980s, as a <coughs> The National Association of Ethnic Minority Doctors, which presents itself as a more radical uh, group, uh, critical of both the ODA and the BMA, uh, is established and uh, it wants to uh, uh, bring forward a private member's bill that says it wants to approach members of parliament and uh, to, it wants to modify the uh, rules affecting the registration of doctors, which obviously are one of the key concerns for migrant doctors in the UK, you know, that need to be registered, <coughs> and uh, which obviously opens up the opportunity to, uh, to work. And, uh, the ODA also along these lines was uh, criticised quite brutally by its uh, ousted General Secretary Krishna Kohli uh, uh, in 1985 towards the end of this first decade that I'm, uh, I'm exploring. Uh, and uh, again, this gives a sense of the profile of the organisation at the, at the time. The uh, person who's just lost in the elections, who was the uh, former General Secretary, who was also quite high profile, one of their quite high profile spokespeople uh, and uh, radical doctor at the, uh, at the time uh, and uh, this was uh, front page news for, uh, for hospital doctor uh, and uh, Krishna Kohli for a talk about the ODA as a, as a 10 year wonder and uh, uh, the quote uh, beneath uh, gives uh, something of a sense of why he describes it in that way so clearly he has this more radical agenda of wanting to take on the, uh, the government and challenge policy and there's an other faction within the ODA which seems to be more 
intent on becoming part of the establishment and shaping, influencing, and is happy to uh, to do that. Uh, and then on top of that, obviously, you will have interpersonal rivalries uh, and uh, dynamics. Uh, but clearly, these are are issues that are fracturing the organisation by the time we get to the uh, to the nineteen eighties. Uh, and uh, it's something that, uh, that un undermines the um, the organisation uh, and has an impact on its uh, its effectiveness. And uh, around that time, also there are arguments around uh, vote rigging uh, and uh, people are committing fraud and trying to keep people, uh, particular people, out of uh, certain positions. So it starts running into quite serious problems by uh, by then. And uh, more generally, one can also uh, look at some of the um, some of the relationships that the ODA developed with uh, drug companies and the way in which drug companies were involved in the setting up of the organisation, providing funding for uh, to uh, to organise uh, meetings. And you know, clearly, as one of the people I interviewed said, well, you know, we get money. This is how we do it. This is how we do. We basically get a little bit of money from an organiser, a, a drug company. Uh, we put on a meeting and we be able to uh, to put on food, etc. But clearly, the drug companies would want something. Uh, in uh, in return, uh, and um, in terms of the shortcomings of the organisation, one might also reflect on the extent to which it is desirable to have a, certainly an element of uh, voting along ethnic lines to institutions such as the uh, the General Medical Council. So to conclude and to try and answer that question uh, as to whether it's a model or a missed opportunity, I think uh, certainly there were a number of impressive achievements in the years that immediately followed the establishment of the of the ODA, which are quite striking when you, you look at the uh, the material available at the uh, at the time. Uh, the ODA rapidly achieved significant influence and access to the corridors of uh, power, and there are at least some instances of direct influence uh, on policy at a national level, uh, which does uh, fundamentally shape. Uh, the uh, the lives, the working lives of uh, of migrant doctors at the uh, at the time, can it be seen as a model? Yes, certainly. I think in terms of its ability to to gain a voice, um, although whether that's something that's transferable to the present uh, day uh, is open to uh, to debate, and it's quite possibly a, a product of its time, and quite possibly uh, to do uh, with the again the the way these doctors were socialised, their familiarity with the modus operandi of the British establishment and uh, I wonder if that is something that is replicable uh, for um, say a group of European doctors working in the UK today or whether it's something that is quite specific to uh, to that particular uh, era uh, and to uh, uh, the familiarity of these doctors with their British ways of thinking going back to the Liam Donaldson quote about uh, the way in which they were quite effective at uh, you know, channeling uh, the way in which they worked to, uh, to attract the attention of the medical um, establishment. Uh, and certainly, again, going back to that quote, potentially its main legacy was, in terms of its impact, uh, was uh, about establishing an agenda and that migrant South Asian doctors were part of, uh, of the landscape and that their needs needed to be taken into consideration. And they also played a part in also establishing BME health uh, as uh, part, of the, uh, part of the agenda. Uh, and. Uh, Part of the uh, what needed to be looked at in the context of um, of healthcare. Um, also, uh, in terms of its achievement, it's worth noting that uh, they were behind the, uh, which I, I was quite grateful for because it was one of the few pieces of evidence I had access to about the roles of um, migrant doctors in the in the seventies. They were instrumental in lobbying government uh, to uh, commission a, a piece of research into the experiences of uh, migrant doctors in the NHS, which was published in. Uh, 1980s, uh, 1980 as overseas doctors in the NHS by David Smith and uh, that was the first instance where really of documenting the marginalisation of migrant doctors and the racism that they faced within the, the health service. And also it's, uh, it was about establishing doctors as part of, uh, part of the landscape and as uh, part of uh, the NHS workforce rather than as migrants. One of the striking examples of this actually is uh, Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech where he explicitly says doctors are not migrants and uh, partly that might be to do with, uh, with him being very aware of having been a Minister for Health and having presided over the arrival of, uh, uh, of migrant doctors. But what's interesting for me is that clearly he sees it as a credible position to adopt at the time to say doctors are not migrants, they're here for the purposes of training. And that was generally accepted at the time. I think the ODA was very much part of changing 
uh, that picture and, uh, and that um, perspective. Uh, currently, things have changed, as, as, I, uh, as I was alluding to uh, before. There's a number of organisations uh, representing different nationalities uh, of, uh, of doctors and uh, even the role that the ODA had of bringing together the um, uh, countries of the Indian subcontinent uh, has fallen by the, the wayside. So in terms of producing a legacy, uh, there is not nothing that's immediately recognisable today to me as, as being uh, directly associated uh, with what the ODA uh, certainly achieved <coughs> in, its, uh, in its early years and the prominence that it, uh, that it had. Uh, but um, <coughs> in terms of uh, its, its legacy, it's also important to reflect on the its inability in a way to maintain the sort of function that it played in its early years as being able to influence the establishment but in a way being able to remain on the outside uh, as, as well and I, I suspect that is something of a fundamental structural issue that any organisation would, uh, would face uh, and I'm not sure it's necessarily something that you can criticise the ODA for but it's simply something that you can, you can observe uh, and some people felt it was a missed opportunity but uh, it, uh, and that's certainly how it was described by, uh, by Akram Saeed. Uh, whether there was really an opportunity there to be taken and whether the ODA could have uh, taken on that, that role in the long term is open to, uh, to question. Uh, so I would say, finally to answer my question, that it can be seen as both a model in terms of its uh, early impact, but also to an extent, arguably a missed opportunity when it comes to establishing a mechanism, maybe not exactly along the lines of what the ODA was in 75, 76, up to the end of the 1980s, but certainly some sort of mechanism for channeling the perspectives of migrant doctors and ensuring they can be fed into uh, to policy making. Uh, its success certainly shows that this can be done, uh, and it should lead us to reflect on how this might be achieved today. And I'll conclude with a couple of quotes which maybe give a sense of, uh, of the legacy of the, uh, of the ODA. Uh, one from Steve Watkins' book, uh, Medicine and Labour, uh, which gives a sense of the, uh, the impact of the ODA on the British Medical Association uh, and the fact that this started opening doors for, for migrant doctors and making them more, more prominent. And I'll also end on a quote uh, with Raj Chandran, uh, who also emphasises the psychological impact of the formation of the ODA on, uh, on British doctors and uh, in terms of appreciating the, the legacy of the ODA in those early years I think that's, that's, maybe, uh, that's maybe what's key. Thank you very much.